Good evening. Thank you to each and every one of you for being here with us tonight. We would like to acknowledge the presence of our PCCP president, Dr. Gregorio Ocampo, Chairman of CME Committee, Dr. Lisa Lianes Garcia, and the Chairman of Committee on Chapters, Dr. Eileen Aniceto. The PCCP Northeast Luzon Chapter is very honored to be invited to be part of this chapter-initiated CME activity entitled COVID-19 Associated Bronchiectasis. Before we start, let us first hear from our very active chapter committee chairman, Dr. Eileen Aniceto, for her opening remarks. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, so welcome to our fourth uh, chapter initiated CME activity. So far we have been talking about COVID-19, but this is, I think this is one of the more uh, unique uh, uh, topic that's associated with uh, uh, the, the topic of COVID-19. So I'm really looking forward to this uh, topic. Um, Welcome to the members of Sa Sa ano, North Eastern Luzon chapter and to your president, Bea. Good evening. Good evening, ma'am. Yes, and, uh, and also from the, our participants from all over the country, 1,009 na tayo. Oh, 1,110. Okay, so sit back, relax, and have a very uh, fulfilling uh, evening of learning. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Eileen. To give her welcome address, let us now listen to our very dynamic president of the PCCP Northeast Luzon chapter, Dr. Bea Agpawa Briones. Uh, good evening to all of you. To Dr. Aileen Aniceto, Chairman of uh, uh, Committee on Chas, Dr. Lisa Garcia, CME Chair, to the PCCP uh, officers and members. To you, my dear colleagues, a very warm, warm welcome to uh, in tonight's CME activity entitled COVID-19 Associated uh, Bronchiectasis, which is an atypical and not so common um, complication of COVID-19 in behalf of the Northeast Luzon chapter. I uh, would like to thank the PCCP for coming up with this kind of uh, activity because uh, I am proud to say that uh, Two of our speakers for tonight comes from the Cagayan Valley, and I want to uh, take this opportunity to thank them, our speakers, uh, for uh, in, uh, accepting our invitation despite their busy schedules uh, from Tugaygarao and Nueva Vizcaya. Lastly, uh, I would like to thank you all for joining us. And we all, always have to remember that um, we never stop learning because life never stops teaching. Thank you and again, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Bea, for spearheading this event. Before we introduce our two speakers, let me first give you a background of our topics for tonight. We have two back-to-back -back equally interesting lectures. First, we will discuss about the new updates on COVID-19, particularly the different variants emerging and circulating around the world. And the second lecture will talk about COVID-19 associated bronchiectasis as a possible complication. Without any further delay, I am honored to introduce these two young and very energetic speakers. Our first speaker is Dr. Jose Carlo B. Valencia. He is currently the chair of various hospitals here in Tukigirao City, chairman of the Infection Control Committee at Cagayan Valley Medical Center, St. Paul Hospital of Tukigarao and Cagayan United Doctors Medical Center, a medical specialist tree at Cagayan Valley Medical Center, 
and currently the training officer of the Department of Internal Medicine, Cagayan Valley Medical Center. He is an infectious disease consultant and president of the Cagayan Medical Society. He is a fellow of the Philippine College of Physicians and Philippine Society for Microbiology and Infectious Disease. Our second speaker is Dr. Michelle Dyad. Dr. Dyad took her residency training in internal medicine at Baguio General Hospital and Medical Center and further pursued her fellowship training in pulmonary medicine at Lung Center of the Philippines. He is from Tagigarao City but currently practicing in Nueva Vizcaya. She is the training officer of the Department of Internal Medicine, Region 2 Trauma and Medical Center, as well as the head of the respiratory unit of the same hospital. Distinguished guests, let us all welcome our speakers for tonight, Dr. Jose Carlo Valencia and Dr. Michelle Dyer. To the attendees of tonight's webinar, welcome and good evening. To the members and officers of the Philippine College of Chess Physicians, Northeastern Alum Chapter, thank you for the opportunity to talk about the impacts of COVID-19 variants. So these are my disclosures, and this will be my topic outline tonight. So allow me to begin with a bit of history. So it was in December 2019 when we first heard of a clustering of severe pneumonia of a non-cause in Wuhan, China. By then, there was already an outbreak of cases, and soon it swiftly spread to neighboring countries before it became a full-blown pandemic in a span of two to three months. Meanwhile, in the Philippines, stories from mainland China became the first to record cases the latter of whom became the first death outside of the original epicenter of the outbreak. And by March 6, 2020, there was confirmation of local transmission in the country. One year later, there are now a total of 1.5 million cases in the Philippines alone, and this includes around 25,000 deaths. National surges in cases are mirrored in the epidemiological curve of the Cagayan Valley region, and it is believed that the emergence of the variants of concern is one of the driving forces for the lingering pandemic. Next, let's talk more about the virus. The Wuhan Institute of Virology identified the coronavirus as a positive agent of the then mysterious severe pneumonia cases. By January 2020, the genetic sequence of the virus was immediately shared to the rest of the world, and this sequence was very integral in the development of molecular diagnostics, as well as vaccines, particularly those which use the nucleic acid platforms. By February 2020, the novel coronavirus was renamed as SARS-CoV-2 after it was discovered that although not the same, it is genetically related to the first severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus. SARS-CoV-2, like all coronaviruses, is an RNA virus and therefore is prone to mutations. Mutations are changes in a viral sequence and a natural consequence of viral replication. As a virus makes copies of itself inside the host, it has a tendency to make copy errors. These copy errors are usually harmless. However, sometimes mutations may provide an adaptive advantage. By natural selection or survival of the fetus, variants with adaptive advantage tend to displace existing strains. This was demonstrated in February 2020, when a major shift in the SARS-CoV-2 was noted with the G614 spike protein strains superseding the D614 spike protein strains globally. 
The change at the position 614 of the spike protein appeared to enhance viral replication, leading to higher transmissibility. But there is no evidence that it caused more severe disease or was better able to evade host immune responses. Since this shift towards G614 strains, SARS-CoV-2 variants of concern are identified in high incident areas with evidence of increased transmissibility. At present, the variants of concerns are the following. In December 2020, the UK reported a new variant with multiple mutations, the B117 variant. Genomic sequencing of the stored samples revealed that the variant was already circulating as early as September 2020. A ver further variant of concern, the B1351, was first identified in South Africa and was rapidly became the dominant strain in that country. Similarly, in January 2021, a variant of concern, P1, was detected in Japan in a traveler from Brazil. And lastly, the recent huge Indian outbreak was attributed to the detection of the variant B1617. Previously, these variants were referred to as the UK, the South African, the Brazilian, and the Indian variants. However, recently, the World Health Organization recommended using Greek letters you know, to describe variants of concern as well as variants of interest. The new system is both a more user-friendly alternative and designed to reduce the geographical stigma and discrimination that can come from associating a virus with a place. Under the new system, B117 is also called alpha, the B1617.2, first detected in India, is now called Delta. Aside from the variants of concern, we now have variants of interest. They are variants that can cause community transmissions or multiple clusters or detected in multiple countries. These include the Theta or the P3 variant that was first detected in the Philippines. The latest bulletin from the DOH Philippine Genomic Center reported that all variants of concern were already detected in the Philippines. Three of the four latest Delta variant cases are returning overseas Filipinos from a ship currently docked in South Africa. There is no evidence of local transmission of Delta vari variant yet unlike the alpha and the beta variants that were already detected even in region two. This latest report is based on a total of 7,250 specimens sequenced by the PGC. This is most likely underestimated and highlights the need to capacitate more genome sequencing laboratories in the country. This table summarizes the phenotypic impacts of the variants of concern, and we will be discussing them in detail in the succeeding slides. Across the board, there is evidence that all variants of concerns are associated with increased transmissibility. Alarmingly, the secondary attack rate of the Delta is 45% greater than that of the Alpha. But increased risk of hospitalization is not yet confirmed, but it is possible. This is because increase in transmission may indirectly cause increase in the number of severe cases in the vulnerable population. Reduced neutralization by convalescent antibodies by the gamma and the delta variants may lead to increased risk of reinfection. There is minimal impact on diagnostics as there is no evidence so far that current molecular assays fail at detecting the variants. The variants of concern have mutations in the S protein, but current assays have targets other than the S protein, for example, the N protein. However, we must remain vigilant and we need to scale up genomic surveillance. How about the impact on the vaccines? 
based on clinical evidence of vaccine efficacy against the alpha variant, protection is attained by the Pfizer vaccine across all severities of infection, as well as symptomatic disease by the AstraZeneca and the Novavax vaccine. Based on limited evidence, reduced protection, but they're still, but still effective against severe disease due to the beta variant, are the J&J &J and the Pfizer vaccine. It is inconclusive for the AstraZeneca vaccine. For the gamma variant, we only have data for the Sinovac vaccine. And based on their clinical trial done in Brazil, it's still protective against symptomatic and asymptomatic disease. There is additional in vitro evidence that there is minimal loss of the neutralizing capacity of antibodies produced by vaccines against the variants, including the Sinovac vaccine. However, against the Delta variant, the vaccine efficacy of two doses of Pfizer is 88% versus the 93% against alpha. For AstraZeneca, it's 60% against delta, which is lower than the 66% against the alpha variant. Important to note that one dose of either vaccine is only 50% efficacious against alpha and further drops to 33% against delta. It's important to note, therefore, to complete your two doses of vaccines. Why do we still vaccinate despite the impact of variants of concern? Vaccines are critical in our battle against COVID-19, and there are still tangible benefits in getting vaccinated. Vaccine efficacy may be somewhat reduced, but they are still protective. And we need to use these tools while we continue to improve them. We are safe only if everyone is safe. How can we prevent the emergence of new variants? Now we need to stop the spread at the source. We still need to rely on the following, frequent hand washing, wearing of masks, physical distancing, good ventilation, avoiding of crowd or close settings, and as previously emphasized, getting the vaccine once it's available. The bottom line is the virus can't mutate if it's not transmitted. We also need a consolidated response, including intensification of testing and adequate quarantine and isolation. One year after the pandemic, hopefully we are wiser, wise enough to abandon these interventions that do not work. So in summary, RNA viruses naturally mutate. We need to monitor the impact of COVID-19 variants of concern. And the only way to prevent the emergence of new variants is by preventing transmission at the source. And we need to scale up vaccination drives. We need to get vaccinated as soon as able and we need to complete two doses of our vaccines. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My lecture for tonight is entitled COVID-19 Associated Bronchiectasis. So since the initial reports of COVID-19 in China in late 2019, Infections from severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 have spread rapidly, causing a global pandemic that has resulted in millions of deaths. According to the currently available evidence, SARS-CoV-2 can affect every organ in the body, leading to acute organ damage and long-term sequela. The upper and the lower respiratory tracts are the main sites of entry of SARS-CoV-2 into the body resulting in COVID-19 pneumonia, and the severity of lung damage is closely related to the severity of the infection. Because SARS-CoV-2 has increased pathogenicity and invasiveness, 
and has now infected millions of people worldwide, it is important to make early predictions and detection of the possible long-term sequela of COVID-19. This presentation aims to highlight the importance of COVID-19 infection causing unusual lung changes such as bronchiectasis. So for the objectives, first is to present a case of COVID-19 confirmed with bronchiectasis and to discuss bronchiectasis as a perceptible complication of COVID-19. So for our takeoff case, this is a case of Cece, 61-year-old female. She's a housewife, hypertensive, compliant with her maintenance medication, with no history of chronic lung disease, who presented to the emergency room with six days history of fever and dry cough, with associated progressive shortness of breath and exertional dyspnea. There was no consult done for the duration of six days until few hours prior to admission. Patient can no longer tolerate getting up from bed due to shortness of breath. She was brought for consult and was subsequently admitted. On physical examination, at the emergency room, the patient talks in phrases. She is in respiratory distress with the following vital signs. BP of 140 over 90. She is tachycardic at 103 beats per minute. She is tachypnic at 33 cycles per minute. A febrile with autosaturation of 85% at room air, which eventually rose to 94% after being given 7 liters per minute of oxygen support delivered via face mask. There's an icteric sclerae with pink palpebral conjunctiva and no neck vein engorgement. There's symmetrical chest wall expansion with no retractions, however, with bilateral crackles noted. The precordium is a dynamic, no murmurs noted. The patient is tachycardic with regular rhythm. The abdomen is flabby with normal active bowel sound and no distension noted and patient has no peripheral edema. The initial investigation was significant for the following. Chest X-ray showed opacities noted on both lungs ascribed as bilateral pneumonia, and the arterial blood gas of the patient at the emergency room was partially compensated respiratory alkalosis with mild hypoxemia at 7 liters per minute oxygen support. Patient was then started on treatment regimen for COVID-19 based on guidelines. On day 4 of hospitalization, patient has labored breathing. There is an increase in oxygen requirement. Repeat chest x-ray showed increase in the hazy opacities in both lungs, more on the right, with air bronchogram representing progression of pneumonia with consolidation. Arterial blood gas revealed partially compensated respiratory alkalosis with severe hypoxemia at 15 liters per minute oxygen support delivered via non-rebreather mask. Patient was then eventually intubated. Antibiotics were escalated for broader spectrum coverage. And the tracheal tube aspirate was submitted for gram stain, culture, and sensitivity, which revealed moderate growth of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is sensitive to antibiotics that were initially started. So the nasopharyngeal swab RT-PCR of this patient came in after four days of hospitalization, which is positive for SARS-CoV-2. Five days after intubation, there is already moderate regression of the previously noted consolidation in both lungs consistent with regressing pneumonia. On day eight post-intubation, 
there is further clearing of the hazy opacities. So progressive winning from the mechanical ventilator was continued. However, on day 12 post-intubation, patient has febrile episodes. There is increase in volume of endotracheal tube aspirate, and it is more purulent and blood strict. Chest X-ray revealed increase in the confluent opacity in the right, and so antibiotics were changed. Repeat endotracheal tube aspirate was obtained for gram stain culture and sensitivity. And the results came in after three days, revealing heavy growth of stenotrophomonas maltophilia. Antibiotics were then modified based on the sensitivity of the microorganism. On day 17, post intubation, there is clearing of the previously noted confluent opacity in the right. Patient was weaned off from the mechanical ventilator and extubated on day 22 post intubation. Focusing on the chest x ray post extubation, there are still lucencies noted in the right. However, there is decreased sputum production already. The sputum is less purulent and the patient is able to expectorate at this time. So chest CT scan was requested, which was done five days post extubation, which revealed ground glass opacities with evidence of bronchiectatic changes. The patient's complicated hospital course of COVID-19 with superimposed bacterial infection in the setting of presumed bronchiectasis is alleged to have contributed to her prolonged hospital stay and with difficulty weaning her from the mechanical ventilator. Patient was discharged after 28 days of hospitalization with auto support at 2 LPM, oral mucolytic, and as needed nebulization. So many typical imaging features of COVID-19 pneumonia are described such as bilateral multilobar ground glass opacity or consolidation with predominantly peripheral distributions. However, COVID-19 associated bronchiectasis is an atypical finding and it is not commonly described as sequela of the disease. So therefore, it is important for us to highlight the importance of COVID-19 infection causing unusual lung changes such as bronchiectasis. So bronchiectasis is a characteristic of an abnormal and permanent dilatation of the airways or bronchus caused by inflammation with infection as the main etiology. So in this era, bronchiectasis is primarily identified and described by chest CT, especially high resolution CT scan. And bronchiectasis on chest CT is described as dilated bronchial lumen relative to the adjacent pulmonary artery, lack of bronchial tapering, or identification of the bronchi within 1 cm of the pleural, pleural surface. So various mechanisms operate to produce permanent pathologic dilatation and damage of the airways. In simplest terms, they may be thought of as traction, pulsion, and weakened tensile strength of the airways. So in normal lungs, the airways are held patent by a combination of a negative intrapleural pressure, which maintains the lung in an inflated state, and the cartilaginous rings of the trachea, as well as the large and medium airways. So the distending forces of the negative intrapleural pressure are transmitted to the airways by a diffuse system of interstitial tethering. So as the lung undergoes fibrotic changes so consequent to severe infection, local retractile forces result in fixed dilatation of the airways or traction bronchiectasis. So the prototypic pulsion bronchiectasis or the permanent dilatation of the airway results from the intense inflammation originating in the lumen as well as mucoid impaction. Weakness of the airways contributing to the development of bronchiectasis may take many forms. 
This could be brought about by the chronic damage to the walls of the airways, resulting in secondary loss of structural integrity, coupled with scarring and loss of volume of local lung units, leading to regional increase in retractile forces. One particular component on the posited role of weakened airways in the pathogenesis of bronchiectasis is the potential impact of airway collapsibility on the effectiveness of cough mechanism. Amplified airway compressibility impedes the air-driven propulsion of secretions out of the bronchial tree, and this helps propagate the chronic or recurring infection that mark most cases of bronchial disease. In addition to the three aforementioned mechanism by which physical forces or weakness of the airway walls may result in bronchial disease, the other major element in the pathogenesis is the vicious circle of recurrent or sustained infection and inflammation as described by Cole. So patient had the severe COVID-19 pneumonia as the inciting event of inflammation and the body's response by the release of elastase, metalloproteinases, and reactive oxygen species by neutrophils results to transmural inflammation, causing damage to the bronchi, bronchi and bronchioles. So this would later on result to impaired mucociliary clearance, resulting to airway mucus hypersecretion and obstruction, resulting to microbial colonization and proliferation, which leads to prolonged inflammatory process, leading to bronchial dilatation or airway obstruction. And this can become repetitive cycle that triggers a progressive lung damage. So in the patient presented, bronchiectasis is a rapid sequela of COVID-19 pneumonia that has occurred in several days. In this patient, rapid onset of bronchiectasis could be due to the severe pneumonia caused by COVID-19 infection and even aggravated by co-infection with Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is common among microorganisms associated with bronchiectasis, and Stenotrophomonas maltophilia, which is an aerobic gram-negative bacteria. Chest CT is beneficial to the evaluation of the course of COVID-19 pneumonia and can further help guide the provision of personalized and precise treatment. Just to present some published case reports on COVID-19 associated bronchial disease since the start of this pandemic. So this was a published uh, case report last August of 2020, wherein two cases of patients confirmed with COVID-19 severe with respiratory symptoms occurring in few days who underwent CT scan of the chest over five and six days of hospitalization. Both patients showed lower low bronchial disease of segmental and subsegmental bronchi with increase in the caliber of the bronchi and the ratio between the caliber of the bronchi and the corresponding segmental artery. So another case report published last May of this year wherein a COVID-19 confirmed case with a severe pneumonia who developed progressive bronchiectasis within four weeks of symptom onset and evidence superadded bacterial infection with Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Stenotrophomonas maltophilia, which required intravenous antibiotics and prolonged hospital stay with multiple failed attempts to win off from the mechanical ventilator. So a retrospective study or data collection was done from pneumonia patients with confirmed COVID-19 admitted in hospitals in Wuhan City, Hubei province from January to March 2020. All patients underwent chest CT scan after hospitalization. So among 90 patients enrolled in the study, 14 patients showed bronchial disease. So the study found that bronchiectasis on chest CT scan is observed more frequently in patients with severe COVID-19 disease than in those with mild or common COVID-19. 
the presence of bronchiac disease could be a useful marker for severe pulmonary damage by COVID-19. So another multi-center study in four institutions in Hunan, China, where in data on 100 cases of COVID-19 pneumonia were retrospectively collected. And among the 101 cases, 53 cases were found to have traction bronchiac disease on CT imaging. So at present, data describing CT findings in COVID-19 is rising, but still very limited when it comes to post-hospital discharge follow-up. So this highlights a call to identify bronchiac disease in survivors of COVID-19 and monitor patients long-term for chronic productive cough or recurrent respiratory tract infection so that appropriate preventive treatment to reduce exacerbations and improve quality of life is not delayed. So in summary, bronchiectasis can be one of the rapid sequela of COVID-19 pneumonia severe. And the rapid onset of bronchiectasis can be aggravated by bacterial co-infection. Chest CT scan is beneficial to the evaluation of the course of COVID-19 pneumonia. Thank you. And that ends. Thank you, Dr. Valencia, for enlightening us about the new updates on COVID-19, particularly on the different variants of concern and variants of interest. And of course, to Dr. Michelle Dayag for that extensive and relevant discussion on COVID-19 associated bronchiectasis. So we may now proceed to the next part of our program, which is the open forum. Uh, the floor is now open for questions, so you may now type your questions at the chat box. So um, for the first question, uh, this is uh, directed to Dr. Uh, Michelle Dayag from Dr. Glenn Ford Refre. How can we ascertain that the primary cause of bronchiectasis is primarily COVID-related and not due to the bacterial etiology or a pre-existing one? Okay, so based on the presentation, the severity of the COVID-19 pneumonia is first the inciting event for the onset of the possible bronchiectasis and the super-added infection like the colonization first with Pseudomonas and then later on with Stenotrophomonas maltophilia. So I think um, the severity of the COVID-19 pneumonia plus the super added bacterial co-infection would have aggravated the development or the earlier development of bronchiectasis um, in this case presented. So I think we cannot really tell at this point in time that it is purely the COVID-19 severe pneumonia that has caused the bronchiectasis at that early part. But I think the super added co-infection, which has prolonged the infection process or the inflammation, which later on led to the development of bronchiectasis. So I think um, further studies really warranted uh, for us to really tell whether it is only the severe COVID pneumonia that will cause the bronchiectasis or super added co infection is needed to cause bronchiectasis later on. Thank you, Dr. Mitch. Uh, as a follow up question from Dr. Ian Reyes, any suggestions on how we should manage and monitor such patients? Uh, so during um, during the course of the management, for example, in this patient that there is a suspicion already that there, um, that there is bronchiectasis during the course of the, the management. Because um, first, we have to be very vigilant in detecting that there is um, coexisting um, infection like uh, the onset of nosocomial pneumonia or ventilator-associated pneumonia for us to be able to to detect or to detect the organism, for example, uh, during the course of the patient, uh, if we are 
mindful that there is a co-infection like development of um, nosocomial pneumonia or ventilator-associated pneumonia, then uh, we can request for uh, sputum gram stain culture and sensitivity. So we cannot tailor on the antibiotic use based on the organisms detected. So and the um, um, antibiotic profile or sensitivity of that organism so that we can uh, give the right antibiotic um, right antibiotic we can initiate the right antibiotic um, so that we can shorten the the course of the infection or inflammation. And the second, uh, it is very important for us to manage the tracheobronchial tree evacuation of um, of uh, tracheobronchial tree evacuation of sputum so that um, when there is um, appropriate evacuation of the sputum, uh, that will, uh, because that is the needus for um, for the bacteria or the another colonizers in the tracheobronchial tree. So in the management, I think a uh, very important is the initiation of appro appropriate antibiotic. And second is um, um, the evacuation of the, of the secretion of the patient and um, beyond. That's it. So during the course of the admission. So later on, for example, the patient is already uh, post discharge, uh, is already discharged. Uh, we have to be very mindful and educate this patient what to monitor, like for example, um, if there will be uh, increase in the sputum production. So there is really a need to to send this patient home using um, mucolytic or as needed nebulization for proper evacuation of uh, sputum or easier expectoration of sputum. Thank you, Dr. Amich. Can I ask? Uh, so yeah, can I add something? Question? Okay. Yeah, uh -uh. actually based on the series that was also presented by Dr. Dayan, the emergence, the rapid emergence or development of bronchitis during the admission is very, very rare. The ones that were actually mentioned a while ago developed probably months after the course of the COVID. So we need to also be wary of that. Now we need to really have a database of our uh, post-discharge patients and really monitor you know, who among them will eventually develop sequela and one of them will be bronchiectasis. You know? uh, in the series in China, for example, developed around three to six months. And one of the questions that they've raised that do we follow them up with routine CT scan post-discharge or do we do, do we go clinical? I think to be more prudent to, to go clinical, no, uh, to see whether it be recurrent infections, which are the com most common complications of bronchiectasis, since, since they are now more prone to infections. So those are the things that we need to uh, to monitor. And all the more reasons for us, no, who, of us managing COVID, to really follow up our patients no, and to document them, a very, very fertile ground for research, no, because you just still don't know anything about the post-COVID course. No, all the more that we have to have a database of our patients who, who and who among them will eventually develop bronchiectasis. Probably right now, during the early parts of the pandemic, only one year into the pandemic, we don't have a good database yet, but if we continue to monitor them, probably we'll get more data. Okay, so there are still a lot of questions in the chat box. So this is from Dr. Lisa Garcia, uh, directed to Dr. Carlo Valencia. Uh, are there data on COVID-19 infection and pneumonia among fully vaccinated persons after two weeks of two vaccines? Are they probably caused by the other variants? Okay. Uh, okay. In terms of the breakthrough infections, we call them breakthrough infections. Those who develop uh, COVID infection after the completion of their uh, vaccines two weeks after. That depends on the vaccine that you're actually using. Now, in fact, no, all vaccines are saying that the promise is 100% protection from the severe disease and mortality. And that's the primary number one goal anyway of the vaccination rollout. But there's a possibility of uh, vaccine uh, breakthrough infections. No? We, they've even seen that in the States, no? that there's a certain percentage that out of the million uh, 
Americans, for example, that were vaccinated, there was a certain 10% who eventually became uh, develop symptomatic disease. But majority of them uh, had mild to moderate symptoms, no? and very, very small por- proportion uh, died or was hospitalized due to infection. And I can even say that in our own cohort of uh, staff at the Cagayan Valley Medical Center, no? if we're going to look at the staff who eventually developed severe COVID, most of them are were never vaccinated or had incomplete vaccination. The, even the elderly staff who had their uh, vac- full vaccination and had COVID only presented with mild symptoms. And yun naman yung real promise of the vaccines anyway, you know, that it's, it's very, very efficacious in preventing severe disease. Now, the connection between uh, whether or not this, this is due to the variants, we do not know. Besides, I've presented in my presentation, no, mabagal tayo in terms of our genomic surveillance. We need to have more uh, laboratories that can do uh, WGS, the whole genome sequencing, so that we'll get the data more real time. No, The data that I've presented was the data on June 21, the next uh, Update to that was July 4. No, so matagal. There was there's a big interval. There's a big gap in the interval in terms of how frequent they they provide us with the data. And most of the time, once they release, you know, that they've detected the variants, uh, these patients are already recovered. You no, know? and we need to backtrace and try to do contact tracing and outbreak investigation. And by then, it's already too late. So it's hard to associate present cases with whether or not it was due to the impact of the variants because the data is not real time. So it's hard to say now, no? But all that we know right now is that all variants cause us increased transmissibility. So in a certain area where in there's an increased transmission, that's, there's a possibility that one of the driving force for that increased transmission is due to the variants, especially in the case of the Philippines where in red we've seen local cases for alpha and beta. Wala pa sa gamma, wala pa sa delta, but at least for alpha and beta, we've even detected that in region two. And that's one of the driving forces. Now we can say it's one of the driving forces, but it's not the only driving force. No? You also need to take into consideration whether you're opening up the economy, your the movement of the people now. You know, some are more lax. LGUs have different levels of uh, laxness in terms of the openness of their borders. So these are uh, factors that can contribute, but yes, we've seen that the variants of concern do have an effect on transmissibility. Okay, so as a follow-up question from Dr. Lisa Garcia, uh, would you know if DOH is monitoring this breakthrough infections post-vaccination? Okay, ideally, and this is something that we can do at the level of the hospital, but all vaccination sites should be reporting them as possible adverse event, no? It's a AFE, no? adverse event following immunization. That's one way of them of tracking of how many among the fully vaccinated individuals eventually became, uh, was diagnosed with symptomatic COVID, no? So we're doing that at the bigger hospitals. No, I'm just not so sure if at the level of the LGU, if their vaccination sites are very, very active in actually collecting data regarding uh, other AFIs, but at the sign up for uh, breakthrough infections, the vaccination sites should be uh, tracking this data. Hospitals who also admit COVID patients should also be uh, gathering this data no? so that we can actually have more information regarding if Later on, we can backtrack that once the data for the genomic sequence are available, we can easily backtrack once we have the data of uh, of our patients. No? That would be easier to, to do that if we have the data on hand once the genomic sequence is available. Okay, thank you, Dr. Valencia. Uh, next question is from our very own uh, Dr. Dina Diaz directed to Dr. Michelle Dayad. Uh, since not all severe COVID-19 patients develop this complication, 
what do you think is or are the risk factors or predisposing factors in this patient? Um, one of the predisposing factors for this patient would be if this patient would have chronic lung disease to begin with. So since during admission, so we, we really don't know the baseline of this patient. So one predisposing factor could be the presence of uh, chronic lung disease. Like, for example, this patient has a COPD or bronchial asthma in, or um, positive bronchiectasis to begin with. So chronic lung disease, I think, is one of the um, predisposing factors for the development of uh, bronchiectasis in severe COVID-19 pneumonia. So I think we have uh, three more questions in the chat box. This is from Dr. Caroline Bernadette King. Uh, based on the limited data that you presented, is the prognosis of COVID-related bronchiectasis different? Uh, I think further studies is um, further studies or long-term follow-up for among the survivors of COVID-19, especially those with in severe cases of COVID-19 pneumonia, is still needed or warranted at this time, because at this point uh, we don't know if uh, the prognosis is the same with the uh, other um, diseases caused by tuberculosis, bronchiectasis, or COPD-related bronchiectasis or other chronic lung diseases that has caused the bronchial disease. Okay, thank you, Dr. Uh, Dayat. Um, again, another question from Dr. Gels Ilarde. Um, in case reports of COVID-related bronchiectasis, are there specific lung areas or lobes of predilection? Um, based on my readings, um, there are... Uh, there are few studies uh, wherein there is documented um, that documented the, the predilection of the bronchiectasis. Like for example, um, there are studies that bronchiectasis is more located in the lower lobes, but there are still very few of them. And I think so further studies later on is needed for us to, to determine the exact or the predisposing lung segments that develop bronchiectasis during COVID-19 pneumonia. Okay, uh, this is from Dr. Ian Reyes. Is there a role of long-acting bronchodilators in the chronic management of these patients? I think a uh, long-acting bronchodilator can, um, can be used in the future as part of um, mobilizing the mucus secretion of this patient. Um, so we can use uh, long-acting um, long beta-2 agonies or... Um, anticholinergic bronchodilator as part of our management for the airway hygiene for these patients who develop bronchial disease, especially those who have um, purulent or chronic sputum production. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dayag. Um, next question, uh, I think this is uh, directed to Dr. Valencia from Dr. Gilbert Howe. Uh, do the type of vaccine you receive determine the incidence of breakthrough infection? Like, it, is it higher in Sinovac versus RNA vaccines? Yeah, uh, we need to wait for the data, especially since we cannot rely so much on the trial vaccine efficacy data for the simple reasons that now the times are different. No, when, when the clinical trials were conducted, the variants were not, was not yet available. So we need to get real time, real uh, world data now. And since there's a disproportion in the Philippines among who uh, received Sinovac versus those who received the other vaccines, and then we need to gather more data. No, but what we're really actually seeing is that there are not, uh, regardless of the vaccines received, we're not seeing much uh, severe infections and death among those who are fully vaccinated. But as to the difference among the vaccines, we've yet to establish that in real world data. And all the more, no, I keep on saying this, we need to really uh, keep track of our patients. Now we need the, the data, otherwise we'll be uh, relying on the data outside. So I actually uh, implore PCCP to and the other uh, 
PCP societies to actually invest, no? uh, even the chapters invest into really making sure that we really study this. No? So oh, there's a wealth of data that we can gather so that we can have a more uh, reliable information that we can use to educate our patients and others no, who would be interested. Okay, so um, I think this is the last question from Dr. Caroline Bernadette King. Um, how about, uh, directed to Dr. Michelle Dayag, how about the role of ICS in managing these patients? I think there is really a role of inhaled corticosteroid when managing patients with bronchiectasis because inhaled corticosteroid would later on aid in the decrease of the airway inflammation. So instead of using... Um, oral or systemic corticosteroid, I think it is more prudent for us to use inhaled corticosteroid for these patients. Okay, so are there any more questions? If none, um, I think that's the end of our open forum. So um, in summary, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the virus that causes COVID-19, is constantly evolving, causing genetic variants that have been merging and circulating worldwide and can cause long-term sequelae such as bronchiectasis. Hence, we humbly request everyone to wear your mask, sanitize, maintain social distancing, and get vaccinated as soon as eligible. In behalf of the members and officers of the PCCP Northeast Luzon chapter, we would like to extend our sincerest gratitude for all participants who join us tonight and to PCCP for giving us this opportunity to be part of this undertaking. To formally end tonight's activity, let us all welcome the Chairman of CME Committee, Dr. Lisa Yanis Garcia, for her closing remarks. Thank you, Dr. Jenna Allen, for that very engaging conduct of the discussion. Good evening, everyone. In behalf of the PCCP president, who's always here with us in all our CME activities, Dr. Greg Ocampo, Dr. Eileen Aneseto, our chairperson for Committee on Chapters, let me thank you all, the, our guest speaker, Dr. Jose Carlo Valencia, for a plenary-like discussion on COVID-19 variants and the significance of vaccination. I thought I was in a PCP or PCCP plenary annual on an annual convention. And our very own Dr. Michelle Dayag for an awesome discussion on relatively rare, not so common, sequelae of COVID-19. Both talks are equally informative and relevant to us all in this constantly evolving period of the pandemic. We would also like to thank and extend our appreciation and congratulations to the Northeast Luzon PCCP chapter headed by the very active president, Dr. Bea Briones. And to all your members, congratulations. You have many participants for tonight. I would also like to thank and acknowledge the presence of our mentors, especially our past presidents, Dr. Bel Shasoko, Dr. Min Banyares are always present in our CME activities. Dr. Dina Diaz, the mentor and trainer of our speaker, Dr. Michelle. Well trained indeed. Of course, good mentors produce good trainees and good uh, practitioners. And Dr. Villas Pin are also here. And to all of you, 138, I think there were more delegates earlier. So thank you for being here. And let me invite you to our, again, upcoming CME activities. So don't get tired with all our activities. We have activities every week, both uh, chapter-initiated CME sessions. So the next one would be a very interesting one, also not so common, by the Northwest Panay chapter. It will be an X-linked dystonia Parkinsonism, XDP. So aren't you interested to know that would be on July 23, Friday at 6 p.m. So there will be many speakers, no? So that would be exciting. And our very own Dr. Abundio Bagos will be there. So looking forward and all the other speakers. Also this Tuesday, the second of a series of four discussions on severe pneumonia, 
So last two, oh, Wednesday, I mean, last Wednesday, we heard from Singapore Experience on severe asthma, on how they came up with a severe asthma clinic. So on Wednesday, we will be hearing from Taiwan Experience by Dr. Pin Q. Fu and moderated by our very own Dr. Dina Diaz. So see you also at, I think, 7 p.m. on Wednesday. So uh, please don't get tired with all these CME activities. Uh, just turn on, on your uh, gadget so that uh, we will learn from all of this. Thank you, everyone, and have a good evening. Happy weekend. See you again Tuesday and Friday. Bye.